walking along Dorset Street, reading gravely, Loon turns to another pioneering model farm in Lower Galilee, which developed into a different type of agricultural settlement under the auspices of Agendath Netain, as he puts it. To purchase waste sandy tracks from Turkish government and plant with eucalyptus trees, excellent for shade, fuel and construction. Orange groves in an immense melon fields north of Jaffa. You pay 80 marks and they plant a dunam of land for you with olives, oranges, almonds or citrons. Olives cheaper, oranges need artificial irrigation. Every year you get a sending of the crop. Your name entered for life as owner in the Book of the Union. Can pay 10 down and the balance in yearly installments. Blyde Treustrasse, 34 Berlin, West, 15. Nothing doing. Still, an idea behind it. <coughs> now, although Bloom's praises and commentary seems to refer to an advertisement giving the Berlin address of the Palestine Land Development Company, it clearly describes the business model of another foundation company. Agendath Netheim is a garbled form of Agudath Netheim, Agudath being the possessive of Aguda society and Netheim plantations. And I do apologise for the pronunciation. Agudath Netheim was the largest capitalist enterprise during the second Aliyah and the largest employer in the Jewish plantation economy. By 1914, it employed close to 20% of the Eastern European Jewish labour force in Eretz, Israel. Given the power and prominence of the company, a fact overlooked by previous commentators on Joyce, some of whom confuse it with an actual settlement, it seems unlikely that he would have mistook its name in researching it, because references to it were ubiquitous. However, Bloom's lapsus linguae is curiously suggestive of the epigraph appended to the frontispiece of Theodore Herzl's novel of 1902, Alt Neuland. Wenn ihr wollt, ist es kein Märchen, or in Nahum Sokolov's Hebrew translation of 1903 puts it, if you will it, it is no dream. Founded in Istanbul with a share capital of 75,000 in 1905, Abu Dath Netheim was the first company to issue stock in Palestine. And there's an example of one of those bonds. It was known as the Societe Ottomane de Commerce d'Agriculture et d'Industrie in French, the Palestine Plantation Company in English and the Geschäftschaft der Planzer in German, which Bloom correctly translates as the Planters Company. A lot of commentators have said he's got that wrong, but in the case of this company, uh, Joyce is absolutely right. <coughs> Abu Dhabi Netheim was conceived as a purely commercial enterprise, but with a strong <coughs> sense of social partnership. On the one hand, the company's aim was to give members of the first Aliyah the opportunity to invest in plantations, while at the same time offering every member of the Jewish diaspora the opportunity to acquire land in Palestine, with a particular concentration on Ashkenazim from Germany and Eastern Europe. Between its foundation and the outbreak of the First World War, Agudat Netheim established or took over four plantations apart from the original plantation of Manucha Venachala at Rehovot, where the headquarters of the company was located, Heftzibah in 1905, Birkadata in 1905, Zaita at Hadira 1913 and Sejira in 1913 and Sejira was the most important one. As Bloom's advertisement outlines, Agadat Netheim acted as an agency to establish diaspora Jews um, and to invest in private enterprise agricultural plantations similar to the Ahuzas established during the early years of the 20th century, on which Jewish and Palestinian Arab workers were employed to prepare the land, plant fruit bearing trees and maintain them. Then, after six or seven years, when the plantations bore sufficient fruit to provide an income for its owners, the land would be parceled and transferred to the individual owners waiting to emigrate. Um, 
settle on their own land and assume its maintenance. Now, Bloom's coinage of Agandat net time is patently indicative of his ignorance of Hebrew, as demonstrated further by his inability to recall the Shema in its entirety and the random collection of words he spouts during his mock inauguration as the ruler of Dublin in Circe. Aleph, Beth, Himal, Dalet, Haggadah, Tefilim, Kosher, Yom Kippur, Hanukkah, Rosh Hashanah, <laughs> Bene Brit, Bar Mitzvah, Matzot, Ashkenazim, Meshuga, Talith. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's rather random. However, his comments on the advertisement points to his awareness of Zionism, specifically the Californian design for enabling urban people to move to the countryside adopted by Agadah at the time. That he is familiar with the Ahuza process and its role in making Aliyah is clearer from his summary of the advertisement, including the forests of eucalyptus which the Jewish settlers have planted and will continue to plant in every part of Palestine, which were specifically used as a fuel source in the emerging colonies. And again, this is something that certain Joycians have pointed to as being fabular. Um, but it absolutely uh, describes the process as described in the brochures issued by Abed Netan. However, this process did not always run smooth, smoothly for Agadot Net Time, as evinced by their management of the Sejira model farm at the foot of Mount Tabor in Lower Galilee, just over 15 miles from the first farm he refers to, that is the Kinnereth model farm. From its establishment as an agricultural training centre in April 1900, the first and only independent venture by the Jewish Colonial Association Sejira developed into a mashav of about 6,000 acres on land purchased between 1900 and 1902 by Baron de Rothschild. However, there was constant conflict with the neighbouring Palestinian Arab village, al Shazira, um, culminating in the death of a Jewish settler in 1904. And this made headlines all over Europe. The principal products of the Jewish Colonization Association settlement had been grain, wheat, barley, oats, sesame, cattle and vegetables, as well as some tobacco. But in 1913, some of the land was sold to Agadath Netheim, who produced um, fruit over an area of 3,500 acres. Also almonds, olives and the vine, not to mention eucalyptus. Agudat Netheim planted these crops with a view to establishing private enterprise, Ahuza, exactly as described in Bloom's summary of the advertisement, while the rest of the land was allocated to the expansion of the Mashava. By the end of 1913, Agudat Netheim in Sejira employed 40 second Aliyah workers and 10 Palestinian Arab workers, gradually increasing to 67 second Aliyah workers and uh, 15 Palestinian Arab workers. At the beginning of 1914, the um, second Aliyah workers demanded Agudat Netheim employ only Jews, and following the company's refusal, they, they declared a worker's strike. This strike did not succeed in changing company policy, which had never extended to employing an exclusively Jewish labour force, and most of the Ashkenazim left. In yet another example of Joycean irony, it can hardly be a coincidence that the two model farms in Lower Galilee, on which Bloom's eye just happens to fall, became the scene of every kind of labour dispute between 1909 and 1914. There were strikes in Kinnereth and Sejira in 1909, again in Kinnereth in 1911, and again in Sejira in 1914. Most of the strikes ended in the collective resignations and walkouts by the workers. And again, this was widely publicised um, in, in the European press as being held up as the failure of Zionism. However, through its foundation, or even though its foundation was a landmark in the history of the new Yeshuv, by 1917, Sejira Farm was in the receivership of the Anglo-Palestine Company though under the management of Agudat Netheim until 1934. 
Sometimes, even if you will it, it remains a dream. Yet Bloom retains a consistent, albeit somewhat detached, interest in the advertisement throughout Ulysses. Agendath, what is it? In Bloom's stream of consciousness, Agendath net time is transmogrified from a limited company, a national limited company of the size of, let's say, Board Namone. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not a small um, concern into an indeterminate orientalized location which appears in Lestragonians, Sirens, uh, Nausicaa and as a Samic personification in Oxen of the Sun. Agendath is a wasteland, a home of screech owls and the sand blind Upupa. Net time, the golden is no more. This process of orientalization reaches the apogee in Circe where Bloom's extensive property at Agudat net time in faraway Asia Minor is used in evidence against him during his nightmarish mock trial. The stage directions go on to state, the image of the Lake of Kinnereth with blurred cattle cropping in silver haze is projected on the wall. However, the landscape soon turns hostile as Bloom is scapegoated by the Irish evicted tenants and observant Jews alike and they shall stone him and defile him, yea, all from Agendat net time and from Mitzrayim, the land of Ham, which associates Bloom's stakehold with biblical Egypt. This dream of Middle Eastern promise is finally extinguished in Ithaca, when Bloom produced from his waistcoat a folded page of prospectus, illustrated, entitled Agendat net time, unfolded the same, examined it, superficially, rolled it up into a thin cylinder, ignited it in the candle flame, which he then used as a taper to light a diminutive cone redolent of aromatic oriental incense. It has been argued that Bloom's setting fire to this prospectus is a symbolic rejection of Zionism. This in turn has been interpreted as a general sense of alienation from the Dublin Jewish community in Ireland who tended to espouse the Zionist cause, which would explain why so many bonds ended up in Dublin. It does appear clear that Bloom's Pixa site of Palestine has less to do with the honey milk of Canaan's land than with the land flowing with milk and money, which is South County Dublin. And there he's making reference to the, the, the early Irish description of Kula, uh, and we're standing in Kula just about, um, as Kula was rich in gold, milk, and honey. Yet he remains supportive of the possibility of Irish political autonomy or devolution on the one hand, and the restoration of Shanna David of Zion on the other. Here, Joyce's phrasing not only draws on Isaiah chapter 29, verse 1, but on the Zionist anthem, Haktikva, which refers to Jerusalem, not by name, but as the city where David encamped, in the refrain of the original Ashkenazic version, written in 1878. Indeed, Bloom intones this version, albeit the first distich, only in anticipation of that multiple, ethically irreducible consummation. Now, the version that he gives us, and I'm not even going to begin to try and pronounce this, though I do try to pronounce Finnegan's Wake all the time, um, <laughs> it's thought that he consulted with Khan Leventhal because there was a Sephardic version and an Ashkenazic version, but uh, quite what he's recalling here is hard to make out. Thus, although Bloom is no longer the political enthusiast he may have once been, his views on Irish nationalism and support for the establishment of the Judenstaat in Palestine generally concur with those of Davids, which were widely disseminated throughout the English-speaking world in the wake of Kishnev. As the New York Times reported, he is an advocate of Zionism as the solution of the great Jewish problem of Europe. Similarly, David declared, I have come from a journey through the Jewish pale, a convinced believer in the remedy of Zionism. 
Commenting on within the pale, Sheehy Skeffington notes that in respect of style, this is the best of David's books. The tortures inflicted upon the Jews in Kishnev with the connivance or active assistance of the authorities gave him such a subject as eminently suited his impassioned pen. The book is an eloquent plea for Zionism. Although not all shades of Jewish opinion admired his espousal of the Zionist cause, most notably the American Israelite, which suggested that the horrors of Kishnev must have unbalanced David's mind, it is hard to account in any other way for the counsel he has been given, get, been giving to Russian Jews. This paper also sarcastically questioned why David did not also suggest mass immigration as the solution to the Irish question. Yet we may note David's paradoxical yet unassailable assumptions regarding inbred racial characteristics that cause Jews to exploit those weak, ignorant or naive, as David put it. David states, if the race generally are exploiters and extortioners, who made them so? Are not historical conditions and centuries of deliberate oppression in every Christian land, Ireland honourably accepted, answerable for the Jewish predilection to profit, seeking by other than the methods of immediate production. And that has obviously made David's defense of Zionism problematic for um, modern commentators in particular. Yet he goes on to ask, and are the Gentiles of the lofty moral school of critics so much above the doctrine and practice of the commercial greed of buying in the cheapest and selling in the dearest market? Now we find a direct reference to these words in Nestor. And of course, Joyce would have known exactly what she Skeffington had written, where Stephen posits the same question to DC. A merchant, Stephen said, is one who buys cheap and sells dear, Jew or Gentile, is he not? In spite of these racial assumptions, Stephen Zipperstein points out that immediately on his book's publication, David emerged as a folk hero among Jews, with plays and poems written about his time in Kishnev in English and Yiddish. Similarly, David's articles in the New York American mesmerized readers, as he was responsible for the most harrowing and certainly the most widely read accounts of the Kishnev pogrom, all of which were sympathetic to the Jewish victims, which catapulted him to meteoric fame in America. Zipperstein points out that in America, David's untimely death in 1906 would be treated very much like the death of a holy martyr, marked by Jewish commemorative events, attended by huge appreciative crowds. And this sentiment was echoed in Ireland as there was a wreath from the Jewish community of Dublin in grateful remembrance of David's efforts on behalf of the one race who had suffered more than the Irish, as Sheehy Skeffington puts it. And also from a representation from the Jews of Kishnev, and in one report it says that some Jews from Kishnev went down to County Mayo with the, um, with the funeral party. Now, in Within the Pale, David vehemently condemns the blood libel, reiterating the papal condemnation of the cult of Simon of Trent, citing pronouncements from bulls issued by Popes Innocent IV, Gregory X, Martin V, Nicholas V, and Paul III, all reprobating this blood accusation as being a groundless and monstrous invention. However, David focuses particularly on the writings of Canon Auguste Rowling, a Westphalian priest and erstwhile professor of biblical studies, who used his academic position to assert the reality of ritual murder during a notorious blood libel case in Hungary in 1882-3. Now, um, Rowling was silenced by the Catholic Church. He, he, he was... Um, subject to the an inquisition there is no such thing as the inquisition and he was silenced but that didn't stop him peddling this um in a selection of books right to the end of his life um which became very popular particularly in eastern europe um what's quite notable about this 
Hungarian pogrom is that the current regime in Hungary, even though there's no evidence it ever occurred, have raised monuments on the so-called grave in the last two to three years. So that's a very worrying development. The invocation of the blood libel at Duborossia, allegedly perpetrated in preparation for Passover, is specifically recalled by Bloom in Glasnevin Cemetery. Here he reflects on a very different concept of blood sacrifice than that espoused by the physical force tradition in his homeland during Easter 1916, because of course this is being written retrojectively. It's the blood sinking in the earth that gives new life. Same idea those Jews they said killed the Christian boy. The actual pogrom in Kishnev began on a Sunday, 19th of April, 1903, according to the Gregorian calendar, as Jews celebrated the last day of the Passover holiday and Christians celebrated the first day of Easter. David gives an eidetic account of the attack on the Feldstein family, one of the most respectable in Kishnev, who owned a saloon on the corner of Armenia Street. The leader of the gang found in the kitchen of the family residence the meat for the family's dinner. He put it on a stick, mounted to the roof of the saloon, which is of one story, and addressing the mob, the police and the military in the street declared, here are the remains of a Christian child found in the house of the wealthy Jew, Felstein. But Mikhail Rybachenko, the murdered boy in Bessarabia, who might seem to the contemporary Irish public as fabular as Chaucer's murdered boy in Asia in a great city, is only the latest in a long line of bloody folk martyrs. <clears throat> this line had its wellspring in the putative martyrdom of William of Norwich, a 12-year-old Skinner's apprentice found dead over Easter, which also overlapped with Passover in 1144. Now, in his second sermon in Limerick, Cray backs up his initial, rather oblique, reference to Simon of Trent with a litany of such ersat saints, citing such examples as Blois in 1171 and Pontoise in 1179, where, like the situation in Hungary over 100 years ago, there, there were no actual bodies in either of these, in these cases. In addition to the cases of Harold of Gloucester, 1168, Robert of Bury St. Edmunds, 1181, and the prototype, St. William, allegedly crucified at Norwich in England in the time of King Stephen. The martyr's body was interred in the cathedral church and the miracles that were wrought at his tomb. And there is no factual basis for what Cray is saying at all. Curiously, Cray neglects to mention the most infamous pseudo-martyr, the young Hugh of Lincoln, as Chaucer's prioress calls him, who was allegedly martyred in 1155. However, Bloom is only too well acquainted with this putative victim of ritual murder, as evinced by his unfavourable reaction to Stephen's recital of a chanted legend, that of Sir Hugh, or the Jew's daughter, where the victim predestined is traditionally associated with of Lincoln. He weighed the possible evidence for and against ritual murder. The incitations of the hierarchy, the superstition of the populace, the propagation of rumour in continued fraction of veridicity, the envy of opulence, the influence of retaliation, the sporadic reappearance of atavistic delinquency, the mitigating circumstances of fanaticism, hypnotic suggestion and synabolism. Quite a lot to think about. One of the more curious etiologies which involved concerning the blood libel was that the blood extracted from the ritually slain Christian acted as a sovereign counteractive to the Feta Judaicus. Moreover, the Feta Judaicus was also linked to that most peculiar of curses, the male menses which was derived from the belief stemming from Matthew chapter 27 verse 25 that Jews suffered a bloody flux each Good Friday in remembrance of their perfidy, which would only cease upon their final conversion. Now, this discharge was usually interpreted by such scholastic polemicists as Raimundus Martinus as bleeding piles. 
partly due to the influence of Psalm 77, 66, and he smote his enemies on the hinder parts. He put them to an everlasting reproach. By the time James of Vitry writes the history of the East, the second part of his history of Jerusalem, the early 13th century, about 20, 1220, the bleeding occurs in a menstrual cycle. The Jews who shouted out, his blood be upon us and upon our children, have become unwarlike and weak even as women, and it is said they have a flux of blood every month. God has smitten them in their hinder parts and put them to perpetual opprobrium. Certainly, the inverted objection of Ruby Cohen in Night Town, Bloom's alter ego as the new womanly man, owes at least as much to this medieval misconception, as recalled by the narrator of Cyclops, as it does to the influence of Otto Weininger or contemporary um, uh, psychological theories. We're told, God, there's many a word spoken in jest. One of those mixed middlings he is. Lying up in the hotel, Pisser was telling me once a month with a headache like a totty on her courses. Indeed, by the time Weiniger absorbed this, this intuitive sense of the Jews' deficient masculinity had been generating for centuries, dating from the Middle Ages. Moreover, the hemorrhaging enervated Jew, due to souse and bat away the odour of being unwell, was in turn linked to the veritable florilegium of negative connotations attached to menstruation. Most notably, that contact with menstrual blood was thought to render dogs rabbit, which is found, rabbit, that is not <laughs> rabbit, which is found as early as the 7th century encyclopedist Isidore of Seville. Thus, it only stands to the twisted, mouldy reasoning of the bar counter, the Gary Owen, rabbit symbol of Ireland as a nation once again, biting the parliamentary side of his own rump, is capable of detecting the feature Judaicus. And the old dog smelling all the time, I'm told those Jewies does have a certain sort of queer odour coming off them for dogs. And Joyce returns to this theme in Circe, where Gary Owen attacks uh, Bloom. Now, Gary Owen's bestial instincts would seem to recall those of the young Oliver St. John Gogarty in Griffith's publication, Sinn Féin. He says, I can smell a Jew, though, and in Ireland there's something rotten. It's significant that Joyce equates Gogarty with Chrysostomus in Ulysses, whose sermons against uh, those he terms Judaizers were deployed in medieval anti-Judaic polemic and with increasing ferocity in later anti-Semitic propaganda. It is also significant that Gogarty's alter ego in Circe, Father Malachy O'Flynn, who would, in the words of Alfred Percival Graves' popular parlour song, Make Hairs of Us All, takes from the chalice and elevates a blood-dripping host as part of um, a fantasy black mass. This particular miracle has been associated with either the conversion or more usually the persecution of Jews since at least the 13th century, especially the Rue de Belette host desecration, which allegedly took place in Paris in 1290. Gogarty's ostensibly demotic spleen provides a loutish contract contrast to John Toland's eminently rational dismissal of the feature Judaicus almost two centuries previously. But it is underpinned by the same nexus of patristic and medieval anti-Judaic polemic which informs the apparently casual anti-Semitism expressed in Ulysses. In spite of David's best efforts to dispel such vilifications as the ritual murder myth, and the blood libel in the wake of Kishnev, and Cray's vicious, calculated, um, false evocation of them. Now, due to his nuanced familiarity with patristic and medieval sources, Joyce is entirely familiar with this poisonous polemic, even if his chorus of assembled bigots in Ulysses know not what they speak. Thank you.